The Net Zero Energy Ready Challenge is a Clean BC incentive program and juried competition for large buildings launched in 2018. It provides financial support for developments targeting net zero energy ready levels of performance and aims to celebrate, promote, and learn from BC's most innovative and energy efficient projects. Integral Group and Vancouver's Zero Emissions Building Exchange have commissioned a series of six technical playbooks and accompanying videos to help our development, design, and construction communities make net zero energy ready buildings a reality before they are required throughout the province in 2032. This playbook and video, developed by RDH Building Science and Zebex, is about planning airtight buildings. Today we're going to talk about planning airtight buildings. The first thing we're going to talk about is an introduction to airtightness and why it's important as part of our building design. The primary reason to be worried about airtightness in our buildings is for moisture durability considerations. Air leakage condensation can be a major problem for both our wall and roof assemblies and cause significant damage to our building enclosure. More recently, heat and energy considerations are becoming a key driver for airtightness in our buildings. Current energy codes require airtight building constructions to meet our high performance targets. Another consideration for airtightness in our buildings is respect to comfort and health of our occupants. By reducing drafts, we're able to make our occupants more comfortable in the interior spaces, and we're also able to control the direction of airflow in our spaces to improve indoor air quality. When we're thinking about air leakage, there's three primary drivers to what causes air leakage in our buildings. These drivers are stack effect as the result of buoyancy of air, mechanical pressurization from our mechanical HVAC systems, and wind blowing on our building. The cumulative effect of these three forces is what drives airflow into and out of our buildings. We're now going to talk about how we can control the airflow into and out of our buildings by using air tightness principles. In our buildings, we use an air barrier system to provide the air tightness between the inside and outside of our building. We describe this as a system because it's a series of components, accessories, and materials that all have to work together to provide the overall air tightness for the building enclosure. We used to tend to think about this as just materials, but it's really important that we think about all of the different pieces that come together to form that air barrier system. It's the effectiveness of the entire air barrier system together that's going to determine the air tightness of our buildings. When we're designing an airtight building and designing our air barrier system, there's a number of key design principles that we need to consider to be able to provide a durable, long-lasting, and high-performing system. The first thing that we have to consider is air impermeability. We need to be selecting materials that are impermeable to air so that they stop the flow of air from the inside to the outside and vice versa. Luckily for us, this is a fairly easily achieved air tightness requirement because a lot of common construction materials are airtight naturally. The second design principle that we need to take into account for the air tightness of our buildings is continuity. This is definitely the most important consideration when designing an air barrier system. The continuity of the air barrier system, including tapes, sealants, membranes, and other components that form part of that air barrier are really crucial to determining how airtight the end result is going to be. This is where the majority of the effort comes when we're designing an air barrier system. In selecting the components, ensuring that they're compatible with each other, and ensuring that they're continuous around the entire building enclosure. The third consideration we need to take into account when designing our air barrier system is durability. This is a consideration that really has to do with how long it's going to last and whether it's going to survive the elements that it's exposed to. We need to take into consideration the service life of the building, the service life of materials that we're installing over top of our air barrier system that are going to conceal it, and how long we generally need it to last. Is it going to be exposed to wind, rain, solar radiation, and other damage functions that may impact its ability to perform? The final consideration is kind of a combined consideration. It's the consideration of strength and stiffness of the air barrier system. This is really because the air barrier system is the most airtight element of our building enclosure, and so it's going to take the wind load applied to the building. When it takes that load, it needs to continue to perform. It can't be ripping at staples or fasteners, and it can't be billowing in and out and pumping air in and out of the assembly. When we're implementing these air barrier systems on our buildings, we have a number of different approaches that we can use to successfully design an airtight building. We generally categorize these systems into interior air barrier strategies and exterior air barrier strategies. Two common interior air barrier strategies are a sealed polyethylene approach. This is probably the most ubiquitous air barrier strategy, taping and sealing a polyethylene plastic sheet on the interior of a wall to provide our air tightness. Another interior strategy would be to use taped OSB. So this is taking a board type product and taping the joints between it to provide the interior air tightness. This is becoming more common in some of our higher performing assemblies that are looking to achieve higher performance air tightness. 
Interior air bearer strategies can generally be successful, but do suffer from a couple downsides. The main downside is that they are often frequently interrupted by service penetrations for electrical and plumbing, and then also by the structure for floor joists. The second type of air barrier strategy that we can use is an exterior air barrier strategy. The two below show two different types of air barrier strategies that we can use. One is to use a sheathing membrane. This is a very common strategy. We can use self-adhered sheathing membranes, impermeable and permeable. Uh, we can use loose sheet applied membranes that are taped at the seams. This is a strategy that goes on the outside of our sheathing and provides continuous air barrier in the form of a membrane system. Another system that's kind of similar, but not used nearly as frequently, is to use a sealed sheathing approach. This is where we're actually sealing the joints in the sheathing itself to provide our air tightness. This can be done in conjunction with water control, so also providing our water resistive barrier, or it can be done independently where a water resistive barrier is applied over top of the taped and sealed sheathing. It can be done as tape sheathing, but there are also products out there that use a sealed sheathing approach using sealants instead. A number of different examples of how these systems can be applied include a loose sheet applied membrane, a sealed sheathing approach, a liquid applied sheathing membrane, a mass concrete wall, a vapor permeable self-adhered sheathing membrane, or a vapor impermeable self-adhered sheathing membrane, spray foam, and also glazing systems. Window walls, curtain walls, and punched windows form an important part of our air barrier system in our buildings. When we're selecting these materials, we need to take the design considerations into account. Durability during construction and in service is something that we need to consider. Is that membrane going to blow off before we install our cladding, or is it going to be able to survive the elements while it's exposed during construction so that we can install the cladding and have a permanent air barrier when we're done? Another consideration that we need to take into account is adhesion of elements that are touching each other. If we're using a sealant to seal between the window and the membrane, we need to confirm whether or not that sealant will actually bond to the membrane and the window. Some materials are compatible with each other and some aren't, and so this is something that we need to check for each set of products that we're going to use. We also need to check to make sure that those adjacent products are compatible. Some products, when they're put adjacent to each other, will cause damage. Things like plasticizer migration between bituminous membranes and other components next to them. Another consideration is constructability. While we can draw a nice pretty picture of how we're going to build this, it also has to be constructed in real life. We need to consider sequencing of the trades, sequencing of different materials and systems, and make sure that we're going to be able to execute on site what we've imagined in the design. The next thing we're going to talk about is detailing techniques to allow us to achieve a high performance air barrier. As we discussed earlier, a very important consideration with air barrier design is continuity. We need to have this continuity at both a building level and at a detail level. What this means is that we need to be able to ensure that there's an air barrier all the way around our building on all sides, including all of the transition and penetration details. One technique that we can use to implement this during the design process is called the pen test. What we do is we draw a line continuously around the building on cross sections and plans to show where that air barrier system is going to be installed as part of our building enclosure system. This is going to include a lot of different elements such as parapets, service penetrations, floor slabs, below grade and above grade. We can also apply the same pen test at specific details. So if we were to zoom in on a particular detail like this one at a balcony or a roof detail, we can take that pen and draw it through our assembly and trace that line through each of the airtight elements to show how it's continuous through the detail. This can be a really important strategy for establishing airtightness in the details as well as at the whole building level. Importantly, both of these techniques operate in two dimensions, like many of our construction documents. But a lot of our details are experienced in three dimensions. A very classic example would be a window rough opening, where there's actually a variety of sequences that are required to install the membrane, sealant, windows, laps, tapes, and all of the other adjacent components in a way where you're going to end up with a three-dimensionally airtight assembly. So while we can think about it in two dimensions, sometimes we actually have to think about it in three dimensions to ensure that it's going to be successful when we actually build it. The next part we're going to talk about is quality and construction. As we move out of the design phase, we'll have our air barrier system documented through the architectural drawings and specifications, including a specification for how we're going to do the air tightness test. Once we have these documents prepared, then we move into constructing the building. At the beginning of the construction, we should establish a construction stage plan. This helps everybody on the construction and design teams to know how we're going to implement air tightness through the process of building the building. As we move into building the building, we want to also make sure that we're having startup meetings with the trades, 
that we're conducting trades training as much as is required to help them understand the materials and systems that we're going to use for the building. Then when we're building the work, we want to make sure that we're conducting field review to review the details that they're installing and make sure that they're being installed per the project design and specifications. We can also conduct mid-construction air tightness testing to help identify any defects or deficiencies early in the process while they can be more easily resolved. When these defects and deficiencies are detected at the end of the project, when cladding, insulation, and interior finishes are installed, it can be very difficult to access the air barrier system to resolve them. Once the air barrier system is complete and construction is done, we'll perform the whole building air tightness test as part of the compliance process. This test is really to determine the performance of the building and that performance can then be reflected in the energy model to determine the energy performance for the project. There's a number of important measures that we can implement while in construction to help us achieve an airtight building. One of these is to establish clear lines of communication and responsibility with respect to airtightness. A best practice would be to establish someone who is on site frequently that has responsibility for the air barrier system of the building. We commonly refer to this person as the air boss and may be part of the construction team. This is the person who will lead communication about any penetrations or transitions in the air barrier system that need to be dealt with and keep track of holes that need to be sealed up. They'll also be the person who's responsible for quality control and quality assurance on the project. Another component of construction that can be very useful is training of the trades. Building high performance airtight buildings is not something that's necessarily been done before now. And so some trades are not going to be familiar with the types of construction practices that are required to achieve an airtight building. A relatively small investment upfront in getting people familiar with the techniques and materials that are going to be used to build an airtight building can pay off many times over during construction in the high quality work that will be executed on site. This can be done either independently of the construction of the particular project, or it can be done on site through mock-ups and then executed as part of the building work. The final part that we're going to talk about is airtightness testing. This is the part that occurs after we've built the airtight building and we're now trying to measure our success. The main type of airtightness testing that we usually talk about from a compliance perspective is quantitative testing. There are some options about how we do this testing, but generally speaking, these tests include blower doors that are installed into the doors of the building and then used to blow air in and out of the building to pressurize and depressurize the building. The fans used for this testing are calibrated and so they're able to measure the amount of air and from that we're able to determine our airtightness metric and establish the performance of the building. When we're testing more complicated buildings, there's options to break the building into zones and test segments of the building rather than the entire building at once. But generally speaking, we're trying to test the whole building all at once to measure the airtightness of the exterior enclosure. As part of the airtightness test, there is some preparation that needs to be done. And often this is actually the more significant portion of the work. Temporary openings and HVAC systems will often need to be sealed. And that requires going around the entire building and preparing them ahead of time so the test can be completed successfully. It's also necessary that the building is largely empty during the test. And so the testing is completed without people accessing the building, moving in and out, opening windows and doors, and possibly disrupting the test results. Finally, testing is dependent on the weather. We need to test in conditions where those naturally occurring pressures from stack effect and wind are not too high as to disturb the test results. Because of this, we often test at night when winds are low and in moderate temperatures when stack effect is not too extreme. Once we've measured the airtightness of the building, then we need to determine the performance metrics. For quantifying airtightness of buildings, we primarily use two different metrics. For large buildings, we're usually using the normalized air leakage rate. The normalized air leakage rate is the airflow through the fans divided by the building enclosure area. We specify this rate at a particular pressure because as the pressure changes, so does the airflow through the fans. We primarily use this metric for large buildings because it's normalized by the building enclosure area to provide a fair comparison through buildings of different shapes. For smaller buildings, we commonly use the air change rate or air changes per hour or ACH. We also specify this at a pressure difference. Unlike the normalized air leakage rate, this flow rate is divided by the volume of the building instead of the enclosure area. Because of this, it scales differently with the size and the shape of the building Unfortunately, both of those metrics and the air tightness testing procedure that we've used so far really only provide a quantitative measurement of the air tightness of our building, and they don't tell us where the leaks are. So if we're performing a test mid-construction or even at the end of construction, and we're interested in improving on the result and locating some of those leaks, we need to look at also using qualitative testing. There are two primary types of qualitative testing that we use. 
The first is smoke tracer testing, where we use theatrical fog and air pressure difference to locate leaks physically by seeing where that smoke flows into or out of the building. The other is infrared thermography, where we're using an infrared thermographic camera to observe the temperatures on the surfaces of the building, either on the inside or the outside, under a pressure difference to locate air leakage locations. Through these techniques, we can find defects in the air barrier system and then design potential mitigation measures. Thank you for watching. If you're interested in learning more about planning airtight buildings and other technical topics, check out our Net Zero Energy Ready playbook series and accompanying videos at sebex.org.